please stand as you are able and join me in the unison for the responsive call to worship. Live in God's love. Let that love be poured out for all God's people. Bring hope and peace to all whom you meet. We are called to be God's witnesses. Celebrate and rejoice. Praise be to God who has called, healed, and given us a ministry of peace. Amen. I will produce this. If you would turn to number 252 in your hymnals, this is a new one for you folks. And after we sing this, you'll be able to tell somebody that you can speak Hebrew. Um, the phrase that is there that is the name of it means blessed be the name of the Lord. And it's pronounced Baruch Hashem Adonai. Baruch Hashem Adonai. And we're going to have Zach play it through once, too, so we can get a feel for the tune. seated. Now please open your responsive reading books to number 62. This is for Mother's Day and we'll be reading from Proverbs 31. If you can find a truly good wife, she is worth more than precious gems. Her husband can trust her and she will richly satisfy his needs. She will not hinder him, but help him all her life. She finds wool and flax and busily spins it. She buys imported foods brought by ship from distant ports. 
She gets up before dawn to prepare breakfast for her household and plans the day's work for her servant girls. She goes out to inspect a field and buys it. With her own hands, she plants a vineyard. She is energetic, a hard worker, and watches for bargains. She works far into the night. She sows for the poor and generously gives to the needy. She has no fear of winter for her household, for she has made warm clothes for all of them. She also upholsters with finest tapestry. Her own clothing is beautifully made, a purple gown of pure linen. Her husband is well known, for he sits in the council chamber with the other civic leaders. She makes belted linen garments to sell to the merchants. She is a woman of strength and dignity and has no fear of old age. When she speaks, her words are wise, and kindness is the rule for everything she says. She watches carefully all that goes on throughout her household and is never lazy. Her children stand and bless her, so does her husband. He praises her with these words. There are many fine women in the world, but you are the best of them all. Charm can be deceptive and beauty doesn't last, but a woman who fears and reverences God shall be greatly praised. Praise her for the many fine things she does. These good deeds of hers shall bring her honor and recognition from even the leaders of the nations. When we gather to praise God, we remember that we are people who have preferred our wills to His. Accepting His power to become new persons in Christ, let us confess our sin before God and one another, using the unison prayer of confession printed in the bulletin, and then by going silently before the Father as individuals. Let us pray. Patient and forgiving God, we come to you this day. For many, there is a celebration of Mother's Day and all that our mothers have given to us and taught us. But for some, these memories are too painful of those who could not parent, who were afflicted. Remind us that your blessings are poured out in many ways through many people. Give us the confident faith that reaches beyond our own lives to help others. Forgive us when we sink into our own selfishness and pettiness, for it is in those times that we turn our back on you. Bring us back to you, to the awareness of your eternal love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hear the good news. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. seated. As we come now to the time of hearing God's word, please join me in the unison prayer for illumination. Save your God. Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Walk with us. Guide us with your wisdom and grace. Open us to discerning your will and your way. Amen. Our first scripture is Romans 10, 1 to 13, and is found on pages 1760 to 61. Sometimes people are motivated to do something that is very difficult. Running a marathon, climbing the highest mountains, feats that few people have the skill or the means or the nerve to try. 
Other people see the extreme difficulty of those endeavors as good reasons not to even consider them. In both Deuteronomy and here in Romans 10, where Paul quotes from Deuteronomy, though with a new focus, following God is shown to not be one of those extreme endeavors that only a few can attempt. Not everyone will choose to follow God, but the way is right there for those who choose to follow it. Romans 10, 1 to 13. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or, who will ascend into the deep? Who will descend into the deep? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your heart, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe it in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Our second scripture reading is from Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32, and is found on pages 14, 16 to 17 in your pew Bible. Joel prophesies about a coming day of judgment, a time of unmistakable signs of God's spirit at work, when people will be in terror because of terrible things that are happening, but also when they can call on God who will deliver them. In Romans 10, Paul quotes this line from Joel that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There are those who think that, quote, calling on the name of the Lord just means saying a prayer. But both in Joel and Romans, it is clear that there is more to it than reciting words. Joel speaks of the repentance that is necessary, and Paul speaks of the faith in one's heart that results in speaking one's faith out loud. Joel 2, 28 to 32. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I don't think that there are many words in the Christian vocabulary that make people feel more uncomfortable than the word saved. A lot of people cringe when they hear it. Perhaps it conjures up visions of hot-eyed, zealous buttonholers 
you know, usually with bad breath, who walk up and grab you and say, Brother, are you saved? Or another one, and this actually happened to Pauline and I, we were on a walk in a park there in New Jersey, and some people dressed very nicely, without bad breath, came up with tracks in their hands saying, if you died tonight, do you know if you would go to heaven? And I said, I'm pretty sure. And they said, have you asked Jesus to be your Savior? And are you saved? To which I said, I'm pretty sure. Maybe it even raises visions of a, a band of Christians at a street meeting singing, give the winds a mighty voice, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. This is a, probably about seven or eight years ago, but there was a, I think it was topless bar that was in Muscatine, uh, and there were people that protested it, and they were out there singing hymns and praying in front of it, and it closed down eventually. One pastor gave a, an illustration where he said, I'll never forget the startled look on the face of a man who came up to me in a movie theater. The seat beside me was vacant, and he said, Is this seat saved? And I said, No, but I am. And he found a seat across the aisle. Somehow, this concept, this word, threatens all of our religious complacency and it angers the self-confident and self-righteous alike. And yet, when you turn to the scriptures, you find that this is an absolutely unavoidable word. Christians have to talk about men and women being saved because the fact is, men and women are lost. There's no escaping the fact that the Bible clearly teaches that the human race into which we are born is already a lost race. You are born with a sinful nature. But of course, as we know from our studies of Romans, that Jesus came to be the new Adam, to create a new race of believers. John 3.16, you know, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's a kind of salvation. So we have to deal realistically with by facing up to this fundamental fact. People are not waiting until they die to be lost. They're already lost. When we talked about election back in Romans 8 and 9, I spoke about the fact that Reformed theologians consider it to be monoergic. That means it only works one way. It's not double predestination where God saves some and damns others. Rather, it's singular because everybody's damned by their own sin. And God saves some for reasons that we do not understand fully, other than He loves us. Paul, in chapter 10, using Israel as a model, answers perhaps a question of why some who have little knowledge are saved, while many who have much knowledge are not saved. Now, he spoke of this a little bit in, in chapter 9, explaining the elective sovereign choice of God. But now he's going on the other side with the responsibility of mankind. It is true that God draws men to Him. It is also true that no one will come unless they respond to the appeal of God. Now to us, this is an apparent contradiction, which is why we call it a paradox, a seeming contradiction. This, is it a free choice? Or is it predestined? 
And again, I'm not going to go into predestination and the various ways of looking at it. We can do that during some Bible study. But I did find an interesting, again, illustration. I, I, this was years ago, and I can't remember uh, it fully, but it says that a lot of us, when we get to the pearly gates, we're going to find on one side it says election, and then when we get to the other side it's going to say free will. It requires aspects of both, and it seems to be a paradox. Paul wants the Jews to be saved. And he prays for them. Prayer is critical. And again, I'm not going to have a sermon on prayer and the effectiveness of it. But I will note this. Paul talks about praying constantly. And it doesn't seem to matter if you pray before, during, or after. After all, God is outside of time. Your prayers can still help. The Jews had a zeal for God. But they didn't understand and know about God's righteousness because they instead sought to seek their own by works, by this fulfilling of the law. There was even one rabbi in a letter who once said, the purpose of the law is to lift men up to God. So the law then is used as a tool by people to get closer to God. That's what this rabbi was thinking. Of course, we realize that we can't do that. And so did Paul. Christ was the fulfillment of the law, and he gives his righteousness to those who believe, not those who keep the law perfectly. And so he goes to Moses, who produced the law for them, after talking with God, and God gave the Ten Commandments. And he says that Moses himself really spoke about Christ when he said, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? Because... He says that is to bring Christ down, so he gives this interpretation. Or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But rather, what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. You see, Christ is not in heaven waiting for us to ascend to him. Neither is Christ in the abyss or the dead waiting for the day of the Lord to come up. He's alive. And He is with us even now. He's with us in spirit and through the Holy Spirit that indwells us. The word of faith that we preach talks about, hopefully, the good news of the gospel that Jesus Christ is alive that Jesus Christ is with us and that Jesus Christ can save us. And in verse 9, he notes that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with a heart, the person believes, resulting in righteousness. Or some translations say justification. And with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. So there's two parts to it. You have to have the heart and the confession. You know, the mouth is the outward man. The intellectual understanding of what has happened expressed in words. One of the reasons why they tell you to pray out loud, even when you're by yourself, 
is because as you say words, you shape your desires and understandings more than the vagueness that is just in your mind. And I really don't think it could be put any clearer than what Paul said. You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Now, you don't have to twist those words to mean that you have to stand up in public somewhere and announce that you believe in Jesus and before you are saved. Any more than you have to say the sinner's prayer before you are saved. Now, we Presbyterians like that public affirmation. That's why we do it during baptism. That's why we do it when members join and they reaffirm their faith. The first question is, do you believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and do you trust Him? And the answer, hopefully, is, I do. So we like that public affirmation of what you already have in your heart. The mouth is the symbol of the conscious acknowledgement to ourselves of what we believe. It means we have come to a place where we recognize that Jesus has the right to lordship in our lives. And I want to touch on that, too, because there was another thing I read that I actually hadn't thought about or heard. And that is, one preacher said, there is nowhere in Scripture that says that you need to accept Jesus as Savior. And it's true. There's nowhere where that phrase, accept Jesus as Savior, or accept Him into your heart, exists. What it says is you need to accept Him as Lord. There's a lot of people these days who accept Jesus as Savior, at least say they do, but they refuse to accept Him as Lord. They don't make Him Lord of their lives. They don't give up their right to make their own decisions according to what they want, but rather let God give their leading and run their affairs. But you see, that's the way that you know you're saved. You need to have accepted Christ as Lord in your life. The whole idea of following Jesus, making disciples or being disciples, which means follower or learner, the whole action of it is that of obedience. The whole core of it is that of giving up of self, dying to self, as Jesus said, and living in the Spirit to Christ. Jesus is Lord of life, Lord of death, Lord over all things. He even said after his resurrection, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. He stands at the end of every path on which men go. And he is the ultimate one we all must reckon with. You need to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And then you need to confess with your mouth that he is Lord. And then it says, you are saved. For the scripture says, and this comes from Joel, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed, because whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And there is no distinction, he says, Paul says, between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord is Lord of all. Christ is the Lord of everything and every one. You need to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. I sometimes like to describe, mostly rooted in, in John chapter 14, but describe Christianity as both the most exclusive and inclusive religion that is out there. 
A lot of people like to call us bigots and, and narrow-minded, etc. And it is true that we are exclusive and we say that there's only one way to God and that is through Jesus Christ. Paul says it right here. Accepting Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, the resurrected Christ as Lord of your life. The only way to get to the Father. But at the same time, we're the most inclusive religion that's out there. Because you see, we don't have any prerequisites. You don't have to get your life in order. You don't have to complete a certain number of prayers. You don't have to complete a certain number of milestones in your faith before you are acceptable to God. God took care of all that in Jesus. Jesus died for our sins so that we would be cleansed and then our righteousness was covered by His righteousness so that when the Father looks on us, He sees Christ. The only thing that needs to be done is to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the Lord. I once had somebody who asked me, you know, I, I accept Jesus. I, I said the prayer, the sinner's prayer things, and, and I go to church and I, I try my best to, to live a, a Christian life. He says, but am I saved? And my answer at that time was, if you're worried about it, you probably are. Because those that have not been touched by the Holy Spirit don't care. They don't love Jesus. They don't want Jesus because that means giving up their own control of their life. I think I would have go further now with that young man if I was to be asked that question again. To say that if you are worried about it, then you definitely are. Because you wouldn't think about it otherwise. He has believed in his heart in Christ being resurrected from the dead. He has spoken with his mouth that Jesus is Lord. And he attempts to follow through on that in his obedience to Christ's call in his everyday life. What more can you ask of anyone who's human. We're not perfect. We make mistakes. We stumble. But as long as we get back up, putting our trust once again in Jesus, running the race, as Paul says, that is set before us, we will be saved. Peter, and we'll get into this in Pentecost, talks about, for there's no other name, he's speaking of Jesus Christ, by which men can be saved. You can't be saved in the name of Buddha. You can't be saved in the name of any other prophet that's utilized in various religions. Only in Christ. And that salvation is open for all. They just need to understand and accept that it's Christ alone that He is Lord, and that through Him we have eternal life. Take that into your heart. Hold on to it. That it might bring joy in your everyday life. That it might bring hope in those times of darkness. That it might bring focus and purpose 
to your life, no matter what age, no matter what state you might be in. God is in control and has a plan for you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you would turn with me to number 390 now, we're going to sing In Christ Alone. sort of an unspoken assumption that if a hymn is newer than about a hundred years old, then it's really no good. The whole idea of worship wars and contemporary tunes and music and even contemporary hymns. But this was written in 2001. The music in 2005 was the arrangement. And this is so powerful a hymn, the theology that's there. The third verse, when it says, There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's cursed has lost its grip on me. For I am his, and he is mine bought with the precious blood of Christ. And then the fourth verse is also extremely powerful. You might take a look at that to think about the wondrous blessing that you have been given 
in Christ by God. So that with thankful hearts, you can think as well on how you can give back of your time, talents, and treasures. Being confident that if you seek to honor God and you seek to follow His will, God will bless that endeavor and God will be glorified. Think of that as Zach plays the hymn, He is Lord. prayer of dedication. Holy God, these offerings are only a portion of all that you have given us. We gratefully present these gifts and trust them to your work in this world. May your gifts share the good news of the gospel to those who are in need. May these gifts help unburden those with the heaviest of loads. Amen. Please be seated. As I noted during my sermon, prayer is critical. And not just prayer about salvation of others, but prayer for healing, for health, for guidance. We want to pray for and with each other. It's part of our expression of love. There's a list of names that are in your bulletin. I ask you to pray for those people by name. If you know the situation, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine too. God does. But pray because prayer works and God is in control. Let's come before God in prayer. God, Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks and praise. You are an awesome God. You are an awesome Father. Lord, you do know our needs better than we do ourselves. You love us with an everlasting love. You have proved that love to us time and again, but especially on the cross as the Son was there and took our sins upon Him and died to cleanse us of our sins, to meet Your justice, to allow us to face Your holiness by giving us His righteousness. 
and by giving us new life when he was raised from the dead. The opportunity of eternal life with you adopted as your children into a new family. Your family, Father. Oh, we give you thanks and praise for all of that. And we know that no matter what kind of trials and tribulations we're going through, that you are there with us because you have promised and you are faithful. And so we ask for knowledge and sense of your presence, understanding of your will in our own lives and in the lives of others. We pray for those on mission trips that they would touch those that are meant to be touched and that they would be touched as well. Lord, we pray for those that are sick and are hurt, whether it be spiritual, physical, or mental. Make them whole to serve your purposes and to do your will. We pray for those recovering from surgeries. Strengthen them. Strengthen their families. Speed their recoveries. We give thanks for a speedy recovery from someone who had surgery and is able to be with us. And Lord, we give thanks for those of us that have wonderful memories of their mom. I know not everyone does. But that doesn't mean we should set ours aside when we do. Lord, may those who don't have it find a real mother figure in their lives, no matter what their age. Someone they can turn to. And ultimately, may they turn to you. For scripture says, like a mother hen, you cover us with your wings and draw us close to you. Lord, we pray your peace upon this world that is so dark, so full of insanity. Help us, strengthen us, so that we might do what is right. And Jesus, Prince of Peace, come back soon. Bring your peace to the entire world, as every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And Spirit of Christ, Holy Spirit within us, give us that wisdom we've asked for. Give us the courage of heart to accept Jesus as Lord, to make him our first priority, to go where he leads and obey what he commands. Give us the perseverance to complete the tasks he has for us, to remain faithful witnesses to him throughout our lives. Not for our own glory, but for yours. And Lord, for the sake of your honor and glory, we pray your spirit be poured out on this church. Keep it from evil. May it be a light in the darkness of this world. May we who are here be beacons of joy and of hope that will lead others to know your love and your grace and your mercy. Because we already know them in Jesus Christ. And Lord, may all that we do and all that we say be to your praise and your glory. For we ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the same who taught his disciples when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know, even though we just said it, because I had my eyes closed because I was praying, let's stand up and sing it. It won't hurt us to do it twice. standings you're able and join me in singing number 323 oh happy day
How may you go forth from this place recharged and renewed, ready to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, sharing the good news of the gospel that we can be saved through Jesus. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. Amen.